Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. Time for a rambling video. This week I wanted to discuss something that comes up a lot and it's not amazing that it does considering the subject matter of my videos. The question was raised most recently by a regular viewer and commenter, New York Dragon, who asked, and I quote, I don't play D&D so I don't know shit, but it seems to me that if there is a great deal more of dark evil bad guys than there is good guys is that the case or is that just my ignorance shining through actually yeah but it's just as much in my fault as anything so i wanted to answer this in some detail and paint a very large picture for you um there's yes there's definitely certainly more some very dark and evil terrible monsters and dungeons and dragons across all the world settings and there is a need narratively for there to be big bad things that the players of the game are threatened by as this is high fantasy the players want to be able to use magical spells and artifacts, so the creatures that they're facing need to be a cut above lions and tigers and sharks and things like that. So there's certainly all sorts of normal threats in the Dungeons & Dragons world, but there's also magical and fantastical threats that uh, heroic characters need to rise up against and fight. Because if the world was just mundane things, then these these extraordinary characters with superpowers would just roll over anything and reduce the world to nothing but lily picking as somebody else pointed out so certainly there is an there's an upscale of the threats in dungeons and dragons because there is this extraordinary ability for the characters the players to have this ability to play larger than life super heroic figures in the dungeons and dragons world in their stories and also you need to keep in mind that there's all sorts of other powers in play that are not often that detailed in the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. If you're just paying attention to the monster manuals and things and the monster videos as I do, then I obviously I threaten I I, I focus on monsters and monstrous things as the subject matter of my videos because that's what people are here to listen about and um, i have occasionally covered things like celestia and uh, bitopia and things but i don't really cover elysium and um, arborea and all these other sort of places that have uh, a heroic good aspect to them and also in um by the way the the Guide to Eberron was just released and I um, was on the Discord this, this morning talking to various people about what's inside there. And there's some interesting passages in there in regards to how Eberron is cut off from the rest of the D&D the sort of cosmos, but it's connected in a way. Um, it's located, instead of a, a cosmic sphere, it's located deep in the ethereal plane. It was a sort of a constructed place to be separated from the gods of the, the other, other realms. So there's a connectiveness to the other realms that is implied there that wherever you have these portals to other other dimensional realms and things the gods are involved and the gods are the homogenous factor the connecting factor between all these different realms that govern the way that things are and that's an interesting concept also it implies that in all these other dnd worlds with the connections to these outer planes and things they also stated that beings from other realms other planes of existence are quite often concentrated on their realms they don't have time to go traversing into the mortal realms the the prime material worlds of other places because they have concerns of their own very much like people um, in large countries quite often they don't even see all of their country and they certainly don't have a lot of interest in going to some foreign place because they haven't seen all of their own country yet similar sort of thing people in local politics get, get very much involved in what's going on in their small town and they don't really pay much attention to what's going on in a neighboring state or something like that because life tends to get you tied up with things which are going on in your immediate environment out of sight out of mind same sort of thing in the cosmic setting of Dungeons and Dragons where people can get very much involved in what's going on in their plane of existence and entirely forget that there's other planes of existences out there that are just as involved have just as much politics and stuff going on just as much um, action and adventure but in an entirely different nuanced way which is governed by that that particular laws and mores and population dynamics and variations of monsters and history and things which are involved in all of those different planes of existence. So when you go into a different plane of existence, it's not waiting for you to get there before everything happens. You are stepping into an entirely foreign environment with its own rules and politics and events going on, and they may not necessarily welcome your existence as you come into their country, just like certain other countries in the world are very like disparaging towards any foreigners who come into 
into their country and upset the cart, so to speak. So the same sort of thing if you get involved in the outer planes, it's usually a traversing into the outer planes to deal with something which is impinged on your plane of existence uh, and change things for better or worse. If you have an incursion of some sort of creature that that plane of existence has particular problems with too, they may certainly join forces with you to deal with an extra power base or something that 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 those type of creatures are setting up in the prime material world because it's like an advanced base or a secondary base that they're setting up somewhere else that they could come back at that plane from a different angle like a um, you know they it's it's a it's a different front in the war which is in, uh, ongoing in that plane of existence so they have the enemy's camps are well lo- um, known and located and they're dealing with it from in a conventional sense but as soon as planner and traveler has become involved uh, it could get very very difficult you could imagine if terrorists in our world for instance have the ability to traverse planes and then come back in from an entirely different direction it'd be almost impossible to tell which direction the, the attack is coming from so same, similar sort of problems with Dungeons and Dragons also um, in the Eberron campaign setting that has just been released there's talk about how it's it's a wide magic setting not a high magic setting which is fascinating in that Dungeons and Dragons has arcane magic as kind of a science it's codified it's reliable it's information which has been able to be passed on from one person to another Another. and it's also information that can be passed on to somebody who isn't inherently able to cast magic like a sorcerer or hasn't got some inherent connection to a divine or arcane source such as warlocks or clerics it's a, an ordinary person has got extraordinary access to world shaking and manip- uh, reality manipulating powers through just reading and learning and educating and able to manipulate their mind to do to to operate in a certain way so the spell slots and the ability to cast certain spells and the, the level progression of a, a arcane spellcaster is far more focused on what they can mentally do than anything else and so in fifth edition in particular they're They've asked the very real and pertinent question, which has become very relevant in the Ebron campaign setting, which has got a lot of psychic stuff in there traditionally. What is the role of psionic power in Dungeons and Dragons? And in, in regards to how it operates mechanically in the game, do we actually need a separate psionic system? So an entirely different power structure, much like divine magic is somewhat different and arcane magic is somewhat different but they both use the same system i see personally nothing wrong with psychic powers operating just like spells because of the psychic nature of spell casting in the first place wizards gain additional power and magic and a, a special um, ability to cast the the very difficult spells and things like that and the fact that concentration is so heavily involved that uh, the the ability to memorize spells means that you keep a spell active in your mind and then complete it and release it as a as an existing thought process that they're maintaining throughout the day and the idea that these wizards are essentially doing complex things inside their head that intelligence is the primary trait of, an, of a magic user of the arcane school because they are maintaining an, uh, an artificial state of mind ready to re- unleash that manipulation of reality which is the spell actually taking effect i find that interesting also that really ties in with what psychic powers are all about so i see no problem but with uh, using existing spell structures and spell rules for dealing with uh, psychic powers just like the existing arcane magic rules can just as easily apply to druid craft clerical magic as well divine magic absolutely so back on this on the topic of why dungeons and dragons is so dangerous and how do people survive in this sort of environment well monsters aren't overrunning everything all the time they are as as Trevor, one of the longtime commenters on the channel, will quite often point out, there shouldn't be dragons everywhere. There's there's not a representation of every single dragon kind in any particular region. There'll be one or two here or there, which is not to say that those other dragons don't exist. It's just that they're fairly rare and the world is very big. And perhaps they don't even exist on that particular game world. They may be somewhere else and just visit occasionally. Eberron and in other places which are cut off from divine control and or in places where... There hasn't been in the in Faerun, for instance. There's a very unique environment with the dragons, with the Drago Rage uh, Mythal, which has caused their a destruction of their society, their civilization, which has resulted in the dragons turning away from the dragon gods and the dragon gods going off and doing things elsewhere. You could say that Eberron is the result of the dragon gods not having any influence in Faerun and basically with at a loss to us what else to do, have gone off into another place and said, well, what if we cut off all these other races from the divine pantheons which created them and just let them be free beings? What will happen on that world? So it's kind of a cosmic experience, uh, experiment that these divine beings have 
have performed and is an ongoing experiment where the other pantheons, the pantheons are, uh, of Corallin and uh, Lolth, for instance, are cut off from the, the drow and the elven society on Eberron. The dwarves are completely uh, cut off from Moradin. It's an interesting experiment to see what happens. One thing I find interesting in the theory that I've had um, and have been talking about in Discord recently is the idea that on Athos you have half dwarves, the mole, but you don't have half dwarves on any other campaign setting. Why is that? Is it just because Moradin is kind of like a cosmic divine birth control that says there shall be no interbreeding of elves, uh, of dwarves and other races? Is that the reason why there are no half dwarves on Faerun? I mean, or is it just basically race? Or is there some other um, thing going on here that's never really mentioned? So is it possible that on Eberron, which is cut off from the gods of the Dwarven Pantheon, there are half-dwarves there as well? Mm, it's a good question. So that's certainly something to consider. But as for, is it a dangerous environment there? Absolutely, certainly. Also, we've got the uh, the new addition of the, well, the grand experiment of porting over world settings from Magic the Gathering. Um, I'm a big-time fan of the Magic the Gathering lore and things as well. I'm not as well-versed on it as, as anything else. I mean, the body of work of of lore of Dungeons and Dragons is vast and huge. I don't know if anybody's completely conversant on all of it, but I certainly look forward to um, Ravnica being introduced as a world setting officially for Dungeons and Dragons because it's such an, a unique environment. Uh, Pathfinder has had a, a city, a world city setting, which has been um, one of their recent additions to their their campaign portfolios. But Dungeons and Dragons, aside from Sigil and various other places, um, and Sharn in the world of Eberron, hasn't really had an, an entirely urban environment. But Ravnica is a world which is a massive sprawling city. So it's an entirely new type of environment. Also, they're experimenting with how the philosophical aspects of using magic ha can be influenced, um, much like in Magic the Gathering, you've got these different schools, the, the colors of magic, which have got a different philosophy, and the different combinations represent different factions, for instance. I find this a great experiment and also it could fail horribly. I don't think it's a worthwhile experiment unless there is some aspect of it possibly being a risky uh, venture to the franchise. But uh, again, it's a modular thing which is combined into the rest of the body of work. So you can take it or leave it. I personally am going to be taking it and running with it because I find it a fascinating place that I want to set some stories. And really that's what it comes down to. How useful is it at the gaming table for me and the rest of the, the gaming community? That's the litmus test of Dungeons and Dragons, really. The law can be as compelling as anything but unless it takes heart in your inspiration and drives you to want to explore those stories with your friends it's a worthless it's a worthless source book and uh, so I, I certainly commend Dungeons and Dragons Wizards of the Coast for venturing and really considering what they're bringing to the table and uh, yeah the way they're handling it for those of you who haven't got access to the Eberron campaign book as it is per, uh, it's currently available for download on the D&D Beyond website so I went and checked it out there immediately um, and I would say it's more like um, for those of you who haven't had a look at it yet it's more like the Sword Coast Adventurers Guide um, and, and that it's a broad overview overview of Eberron. doesn't go into a huge amount of detail on anything. It does bring you the Kalishtar, the, uh, the Warforged, all of the races and things like that that um, are a part of it. It doesn't go into, into any detail on the monsters and ecologies of Eberron, although it does bring you the dragon riders, um, the raptors that the, the halflings ride on the Talentha Plains. So that's interesting. It doesn't go into a huge amount of detail on magic items and things like that, which are unique to the setting. Uh, it does give you a broad overview of the continent, the cosmology, which is very interesting and the the general topography of Corvair and, and that sort of thing and what, what it's like to run a setting there. So I'd say it's more like a player's handbook of Eberron um, and that I can predict that they're going to bring a lot of DMs Guild expansions and things like that to the game for Dungeon Masters in the form of adventurers and things like that. And I certainly encourage anybody who is interested in Eberron to write so, uh, write adventures for the, the campaign setting. Include the, uh, the monsters and things like that that you love from Ebron and release those on the, uh, the the DMs Guild because they will probably be very heavily promoted um, and brought to the top of the page, which is Wizards of the Coast's open policy on supporting uh, material with which the fans create 
in conjunction with the, the official material that they release because it's a symbiotic system there and I think that's that's to be commended. So as for the main topic of is Dungeons and Dragons dangerous? Yes it is. But it's also a very broad, vast environment. There's a lot of good creatures, there's a lot of good factions and things which are working to keep everything stable and keep the status quo. There's also a lot of very good factions which are actively fighting against evil all the time and good and the extremes of good and evil are quite often at deadlocks with each other. So they don't often spill over into the neutral sort of civilized areas. They keep those um, as as the, the strongest contentions are on the borders of things, not necessarily in the civilized heartlands. They're often protected against incursions by evil creatures, by powerful mages. There's high level characters everywhere, which at the same time as they just sort of settle down and relax in their keeps and strongholds, they also have access to the ability to damn near instantly transport across the, the landscape. They have the ability to unleash a massive amount of firepower in a, in a, in a quick amount of space in a short amount of time. And um, they have the ability to basically keep these islands of stability um, as their domains. So kingdoms and fiefdoms and things like that and majocracies and those sort of things are protected by powerful beings who can prevent um, evil basically rolling in and rolling over uh, the places of, of good and light and stability and civilization. So a large amount of the protection of the Dungeons and Dragons world is implied really it's it's not it doesn't need to be overly stated people can raise farm raise stock and t tend farmlands and things like that because there's archmages and towers there's powerful paladins there's avatars of gods of good and things like that that will stop the incursions of ankegs and bullets and things like that before they even get there so i hope that answers some of those concerns and questions. If you have any additional thoughts and things that you'd like to address, certainly put them down in the uh, comment section down below and uh, I'll, I'll, as always, answer and try and reply to and expand upon your knowledge. If you ask me any, any questions down there, I'll do my best to answer, as always. That'll do it for this particular ramble. Thanks for listening, everybody. This is a an unscripted video for a change. You may detect a slight difference in the cadence of my speaking, but I hope there wasn't too many ums and ahs in there for everybody. I might have trained myself out of doing it as much as I used to. Thanks for listening, everybody. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so, and be sure to hit that notification bell as I upload from the other side of the world sometime in your future. For access to all of the scripts and one week advance access to these videos, consider becoming a patron of the channel on Patreon for a minimum of just one dollar per month as you get access to the videos a week before everybody else does generally speaking and also you get priority on requests for any videos that you would like me to make for you uh join the community on our discord server i will um like this morning come on there and to talk about um, stuff as soon as it arrives in the DD community and i'll have discussions about your campaigns and things like that that's one way to pick my brain and get information that you may need and also if you want to pick up a new video game at a significant daily discount there's a new game every day uh, in the chrono link down below and also there's a link to my merch store which has got new merchandise available there's some shirts and things like that there's doggy bandanas there's buttons there's mugs there's all that sort of thing uh, for ladies and men Thank Thanks for listening everybody, I'll catch you later, I'll be back with more for you very soon.